Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast, where we dive into how emerging technologies will impact the world and your bank account. I'm Trent Fowler, and my co-host and I, Thomas Fry, are futurists, keynote speakers, and consultants with decades of experience in analyzing emerging trends and communicating them to audiences all across the world. Reach out to us at futuratipodcast.com slash contact dash futurati to hire us for consulting, to speak at your event, or to uh, advertise on this podcast. I will also mention that uh, I don't know if you've looked at the classifieds recently, but it's a bit of a bloodbath out there, and I am one of the millions of layoffs that have occurred in the past couple of months. So if you want somebody with deep experience in machine learning, in communications, or in developer relations, reach out to me at the same uh, address, futuratipodcast.com slash contact dash futurati to hire me to take your organization to the next level. So we've got something a little unusual for you today. I am reposting an interview I did on Lee Pearson's Cutting Edge podcast, which you can find over at the Ayn Rand Center UK. And I have been listening to the show for, for quite some time. I, I find them to be really fascinating and they like to get into the nitty gritty of things like introspection and consciousness and free will and uh, various other sorts of things that are, that are fascinating. And not so long ago, they put up an episode on the singularity. And I thought like 90% of it was quite good, but there were a couple of places where they discussed the concept of a singularity. And I felt like they were not doing it justice. Uh, they, they were not approaching it or understanding it in the way that a person like me, who's been following that discussion for a long time would approach it. So I left them this lengthy comment on their YouTube channel and they reached out to me a couple of weeks later and said, we'd love to have you on the show to take the other side of this debate and we'll, we'll see where it goes. So. Uh, we, we scheduled that and the, the episode aired a couple of weeks back. We're reposting it here now because I think it would also be of interest to this audience. I thought they did a fantastic job of understanding my, my case and pushing back on places where I was using floating abstractions or failing to appreciate the philosophical underpinnings of one idea or another. And it gave me a variety of really good questions to carry forward with me as I think through some of these important issues. So I hope you like it as much as I do. This is uh, an interview I did on Lee Pearson's Cutting Edge podcast, which you can find at the Ayn Rand Center UK. Welcome to The Cutting Edge with Dr. Lee Pearson and Dr. Robert Stubbefield. I'm Steve Richens, and today, the show, we have a special guest, Trent Fowler. Trent, Trent is an author, a futurist, an engineer, also the co-host of the Future Roddy podcast. Our topic today is, are we approaching a technological singularity? And so I will turn it over to Trent. Yeah, guys, thanks so much for, for having me on the show. I'm a longtime fan, a longtime fan of Ayn Rand's work, and I'm very happy to see that there are more podcasts exploring some of these things. And, and this set of topics in particular really excites me because I, I'm always listening to you know Dr. Salmieri's lectures on epistemology or, or somebody else's lectures on ethics and thinking, uh, I, I wonder how this would play out if brain-computer interfaces or brain-to-brain or -brain interfaces were viable technologies today. And I, I wonder if this, uh, if concept formation will work in exactly the same way for a, an artificial super intelligence or something like that. So very excited to see that you guys are, are plumbing some of those depths and, and really getting into the weeds on, on far out objectivism. Uh, actually, I've, I've gone back and forth with uh, E.L. Moses a couple of times on those questions. I would read some science fiction book and reach out to him and say, well, how does objectivism answer this? And we'd, we'd exchange email. So glad to see that there's a more public platform where those conversations are happening. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a machine learning engineer by trade, so that's not artificial intelligence exactly, but I do spend a lot of my day building systems that data. We can talk a little bit about the ways in which machine learning is different from artificial intelligence and how information from machine learning or advances in machine learning were down to questions on artificial intelligence. And I co-host the Futurati podcast, where we talk about everything from blockchain technologies to quantum computing to uh, bleeding edge neuroscience. Last night, I, I finished up an interview with a, a gentleman who thinks about neurotechnology and the law. So how do you set up regulatory frameworks for uh, the day in which it'll be possible to read information off of people's brains? What's, what does a right to privacy look like in those circumstances? So you can find that anywhere you get podcasts or check us out on futuratipodcast.com. And the impetus for having me on the show came about because I was listening to 
one of your episodes on life extension technology and the singularity. And I felt like all of it was very, very good, but I did not recognize in your definition or discussion of the singularity, any of the, the ideas that actually come from the community of people who are really into that. And I'll just issue the caveat right now in the beginning that I, I am somewhat out of date on that. So about 10 years ago, I was living in South Korea. I had become fascinated by what they call existential risk. So the, the possibility of human extinction and the, the various ways in which that could come about and how you could mitigate it. And one of the more interesting ones to me was the possibility of, a, of either an indifferent or an actively malicious artificial general intelligence that was much, much smarter than human beings and could outfox us in various ways. Uh, so I, I didn't wanna be a dilettante. I really got into the math. I got some textbooks on discrete math and started teaching myself those things and doing a lot more Python programming and really trying to get into it. And I say all that just to say that, you know, 10 years ago, I was very, very up to date on it. I was arguing with computer science professors and, and going back and forth with people, posting on forums and all that. Uh, I have not been as into it since then. I've had two kids and I switched careers into machine learning and I started a podcast. I've just, I've got other things to do besides argue with people about artificial intelligence. But uh, as of 10 years ago, I was, I was very up to date. I think the field has moved on a little bit since then, but uh, you can take my comments as being not necessarily indicative of the state of the art, but a kind of good place to begin. So the, the main contention that I had with, uh, I believe it was Dr. Pearson's statement, was defining the singularity as being a, a time in which there's infinite knowledge. And I didn't re-listen to the episode. This is all from memory. I may not have that right. And I, I've never heard anybody define it that way. And I've never heard anybody talk about it in a way that would lead me to believe they had that in mind. Uh, as we were talking about before we started recording the show, the term singularity has kind of become so overloaded that none of the really rigorous people use it anymore. There's more of a move towards talking about, for example, an intelligence explosion where a, an algorithm will recursively self-improve and each successive iteration gives it more ability to modify its underlying source code, which raises its ceiling even higher and then it sort of gets out of hand and it becomes intelligent very, very quickly. Uh, and there's lots of debate on over how quickly that could possibly happen. We can get into that if you like. Um, for that reason, there, there's fewer people who actually talk about the singularity. Uh, usually you'll either talk about the intelligence explosion or, or some other related concept that's a little less overloaded. But that was, uh, I, I loved the conversation. I thought all the stuff on life extension was great. I thought, you know, many of your comments were very good, but I figured, you know, given that I was really involved in the debate at one time, I'm a machine learning engineer, we could get on here and, and, and talk a little bit about the singularity or the intelligence explosion as you guys would like. Okay. okay, so tell us, uh, tell, uh, uh, given that, which I, I don't remember what I said exactly, I think what I had in mind was the idea that, uh, uh, you know, a singularity is uh, in mathematics is um, uh, something like an inflection point, a point where, where uh, there's no derivative and, and you kind of approach it like it's not the same as an asymptote. So we should, maybe we shouldn't get in the math here, but I, what I was thinking of was that, that knowledge would be uh, expanding so rapidly, so exponentially. I mean, I don't believe in an actual infinity, so I don't know if I endorsed one, but it would be exploding so, so um, uh, enormously that it would uh, rapidly approach something uh, like, uh, like infinity. It would be a huge amount of, 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 uh, of knowledge uh, would result from this. Now, I, I don't know where that fits the definition. Steve sent me this nice little piece that showed uh, 17 definitions. And that showed me that the people in the field don't, are not very clear about what they're talking about. So we're going to have to have you to clarify this, this point. So I, yeah. I, I, I give myself some excuse for it. But I was thinking of, I was thinking of a, a, a drastic increase in knowledge. And of course, you don't need a singularity for that. There's certain, something does increase exponentially. I'm not sure that it's knowledge. Um, it's something like data or maybe information has been expected because we have more more of that every year, you know, huge amounts, mm -hmm. uh, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, I don't know, lots of bytes of stuff. Is it knowledge? I don't know. Um, it, it, science is increasing, is improving, but is it improving exponentially? I don't, I, I don't have that impression myself that scientific knowledge is going that way. Um, a lot of the low hanging fruit of science were picked off by early geniuses like, you know, Newton and uh, uh, Darwin and Einstein. And so the, that, that stuff is, we, we, it's harder to get stuff nowadays, but there are a lot more scientists there. Uh, I, I've heard anyway, people say that there are more scientists now 
than in all of uh, recorded the rest of recorded history, and that could well be true. And you know, papers are flying around. You know, there's a huge amount of publication. But is there a lot of knowledge in that stuff? I don't know. Is it exponential? I don't know. Uh, my impression, anyway, and I'm I'm going to turn it back to Trent here in a second, um, is that this the notion of a singularity, which I'm going to let Trent define, uh, whatever it is, deep uh, is possibly highly dependent on a, on a certain um, development in, uh, in in computation, namely the, the development of actual real human-like but better than human-like intelligence. And that's what we need to, uh, that, that's I think is a key thing to discuss. Uh, and there's more to that, but I think I'll turn it back to you, Trent, see what you can do with telling us what uh, the singularity really is. Yeah, well, as luck would have it, I have the one singular definition. So if you all want to oh. ready your pens and take this down. No, all right. Uh, so, so the idea is is supposed to be analogical to a singularity in physics. And singularities yeah. are supposed to be at the heart of a black hole. And effectively, the, the laws of physics and the laws of math, all of our models of, of the way in which the universe works, break down or no longer predict what would happen there. The forces go far beyond what we can do anything with. And we, we really just can't say much about what is, what is actually happening in the heart of a black hole. And it's we're supposed to be taking that and using it as an analogy for what would happen in the event of a superhuman artificial intelligence. So say that, you know, right now we write up an algorithm that begins to recursively self-improve and it becomes gradually smarter and smarter until it's smarter than any human being that's ever lived until maybe it's smarter than the sum of all human beings alive today. There's just not much you can say about what the economy or society or technology or science would look like on the other side of that. If you look at your basic trends lines like GDP growth or uh, Moore's law, th things that have been you know relative constants for decades or for centuries, you just, you can't in any sensible way assume that those trends will continue because all of those are assuming that human beings are roughly as smart as human beings have always been. And maybe we have better computers, maybe we have slightly better tools, but the basic algorithms that run in a human mind are not changing dramatically. And if you have for the first time in history, something that is as smart as a human being, and importantly is alien, has an architecture that is not like a human architecture, a human cognitive architecture, then all your guesses, all your assumptions kind of go out the window. And that's sort of the idea behind a singularity. It's supposed to be sort of like peering into a black hole where you just no longer can say anything. All your assumptions are broken. Uh, as I was saying earlier, th there's been a move away from that term because you know, people think that Wikipedia was a, a singularity. I've had people tell me that the free market is <laughs> something like that. And I just, I, I, get, I get kind of tired of, of arguing that. So now we, we are moving more towards precise terminology like an intelligence explosion. But for the purposes of this conversation, there's no reason we can't adopt the, the singularity provisionally and, and kick it around for a while. I think this okay. theory yeah, go is, ahead, uh, is impossible because it's 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 like the theories of you know everything or the end of history or the Big Bang th theory. All of these th theories are pregnant with ad hoc ideas that that um, unless you you delimit seriously and and i'm not a subject expert on any of these top, topics and so if i make any any conceptual errors i rely on lee and bob to correct my uh confusions oh. and so so uh, uh i think there's a methodological error uh in huge it's just but i don't want to uh uh, make uh, I don't want to run too quickly and slam dunk on on this I think <laughs> but I already did so anyway Lee or Trent no go ahead should, should I add and break the case you want you want to uh, say what you want to say with that what the uh what the flaw is Steve or go ahead well I thought I already said it it's it's just that it's oh, an abstraction okay. without a uh, concrete I see. I see. Okay. basis which part of it? The, the singularity is an abstraction well, without a basis? All of it. Uh, a prediction is the most, it is the simplest delimitation that I can get. And and a prediction, you know, we can predict the w weather and we can uh, self-driving cars. You know, when you take your hands off a of Tesla, you know, you can see that something is going on there. And you can see your smartphone do all of these and, and chess playing like Lee mentioned earlier, but 
there's not much when you break down the these concepts like accelerating you know exploding combinatorial explosive you know <laughs> it's just recursive self improvement yeah so well so so let me let me note a couple of things you mentioned trends that we're seeing so self driving cars are getting better year over year uh, cell phones are getting better year over year 10 years ago maybe well maybe 20 let's say the idea that soon enough an ai would beat the the greatest living chess players and go players handily probably would not have been seen as ridiculous but i i think they would have thought that was fairly optimistic and yet here we are so so we can see that this technology is improving all the time and i'll just note uh we, we don't have to go down this rabbit hole if you want to but it's turned out that deep learning has gotten us further than we thought it would a, a lot of people myself included imagine that you would need maybe a logical architecture underneath it you would need some sort of different approach uh maybe a, a top to bottom agent architecture and that uh, that may still end up being the case but deep learning has gotten us a lot further than we thought it would i mean what they're putting in self-driving cars are just convolutional neural networks and uh alpha zero is powered by something very similar so yeah a lot of us have been surprised at how far we got with just a lot more data and a lot bigger machines but that having been said ultimately we have at least one example of a gi a general intelligence which is human beings and as far as we know there's really nothing magical going on in there now that's not to say that we actually have a working model of human intelligence or i could just go build one you know out of transistors or anything like that but we do know it is at least possible and we don't have any reason to suppose a priori that a, a silicon based intelligence would not be able to function at the level of a of a human brain and and we can we can talk about like i got some pushback from byron reese recently on an episode of the futurati podcast so we can get into why that is uh why you know i, I don't think the quantum processes are factoring in the in the cognition and, and even if they were i don't think that would save you but either way we, we know that human intelligence isn't magical uh we don't exactly know what its constituent parts are but we are getting this technology better year by year and it's easy enough to just extrapolate that forward and not necessarily say, okay, so in 2091, it's gonna be roughly at the level of a human being, but there's no reason to think that we're gonna get at, you know, the level of a monkey and there'll just be no way to improve it beyond that. And as far as the recursive self-improvement goes, and this is part of the linchpin of the argument, it's one of the reasons to maybe be sort of afraid of it, is if you've got a silicon-based intelligence, it, it will, unless you put up special safeguards, be able to access its source code and directly introspect on the processes that are driving its intelligence in a way that human beings can't. So when I am able to come up with a good analogy for an idea or I conjugate a, a verb in, in Russian correctly or whatever, I, I'm not able to look in on what it is that's actually doing that. I, I can sort of indirectly train it by focusing more or by optimizing my environment or taking smart drugs or drinking a lot of coffee or getting better sleep. But I can't just go in there and say, okay, so here is the circuit that's activating. Here's the exact way it's transforming these inputs. And here's how I'm going to make that better in the way that I could when I'm coding an algorithm or working on a model like that. If you've got a silicon based intelligence and you have not properly configured it to sandbox its source code, then it can look in there and say, okay, well, I, I can increase RAM in various ways. I could maybe increase storage. That's all sort of low hanging fruit, but it can also go in and maybe do algorithmic uh, updates, algorithmic rewrites and actually function at a higher level. Maybe it's not very much, Maybe it's five or 10%, but if I were five or 10% smarter and I had the ability to introspect on the algorithms driving my intelligence, I imagine that I'd be able to wring even more out of the basic system. Now, it's an open question as to whether or not that can actually increase forever. So we've got some weak examples of systems that are able to recursively self-improve, and we've got uh, examples, ma sort of mathematical specifications of systems that are able to do stuff like this, which haven't actually been built, but you know are theoretically feasible. Uh, now, it could be the case that once we start turning on these algorithms and they start recursively self-improving, maybe, maybe recursion just only gets you so far. May maybe you can only do 100 rewrites and is diminishing returns every time. I mean, all that could be true. I actually asked Eliezer Yudkovsky about that one time. He's a very prominent voice in this field. I said, well, how do we know that this recursion process is just going to be able to increase forever? Maybe the algorithm gets, you know, maybe it's smarter than the smartest human, but not so dangerous that it can fight all of us. And he said, that could be the case. I'm not willing to bet the future on it. So it, it, you're, you're right to say that you know, some of it's very provisional. There's wide error bars around a lot of it. There's probabilities attached to a lot of it. But between the fact that human intelligence isn't magical, we can see these trends increasing, we have no good reason to think that recursive self-improvement is impossible, I at least think it's worth thinking about. Okay, that was quite, quite nice, quite excellent. I'm going to try to give you at least one or maybe two reasons why, uh, why recursive, what you call recursive self-improvement is limited, will not just go on forever. 
Let me just try to do that. Uh, you're, uh, quickly, I'm gonna be as brief as I can here. Uh, I, I imagine you're familiar with, with John Searle's Chinese room argument. I'll bet you are, because everybody's heard that. I have a better version, or I think I have a better version of that <laughs> argument that I came up with as a grad student way back in prehistoric times. That's so probably before Searle, but see, I didn't publish it. So that's what happens. You got to publish <laughs> your stuff, I guess. Anyway, yeah. so here's what happened. I like mine better because it's more, it's more, uh, you can, con you can concretize it better. The Chinese room is, is so, like most thought experiments, is so impossible that people come up with weird, there, there are all kinds of weird answers to that that I don't think are really good. And I'm not sure they would apply to my version. So let me give it to you briefly. When I was a grad student at Cornell back in, uh, before there were, um, um, you know, Good real computer programs. <laughs> you know, there were some, you know, they, were, they weren't very good. Anyway, back in those, uh, in those ancient times, a woman who I can't remember her name, sorry, from Carnegie Mellon, the, the holy temple of cognitive simulation programs in those days at least, came to Cornell to describe her computer program for simulating um, first year physics problem solving behavior. This program would solve, you know, mechanics, the kind of basic, mostly mechanics, maybe electricity, I don't know, the basic problems you get in, in first year physics course. So she told, explained this afterwards uh, uh, in, in the question period, I, I put up my hand and said, well, couldn't somebody who knows nothing about physics whatsoever, knows nothing at all, has no understanding of physics, sit down and, if, and with the hand simulate the program, you know, work through it on paper and come up with the results and solve all the problems that you can solve with this program, every problem without understanding fact one about physics. And therefore this has nothing to do with human, uh, with the understanding of physics. Even if it works, it's doing it by a way that is instead of intelligence, it's, it's a different process than intelligence. And I think that's absolutely the way all programs work. I don't believe, I, even though I love artificial intelligence, as I mentioned to you in the, before the show started, I like the, everything that they're doing because it, they, they tend towards the, uh, showing that all automatic activities of organisms do not, re, the active, automatic activities do not require consciousness. And that fits my theory of consciousness because I believe consciousness is all about volition. So I, I really like to see those Boston Dynamics robots and you know, uh, Alpha Zero and all that stuff I think is great, but it's not intelligent. What Alpha Zero does, and it's, if I may switch over to that for a moment, um, it can beat me, no, no problem. It's, it's, in fact, it's so good that it's just about as much better than the world champion in chess as the world champion is better than I am, which is a lot. So it's really, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really quite good, that thing. Okay, it's good at, but like all such programs, it's fragile. Uh, you know, you change things a little bit and it doesn't perform. Even There are even some chess positions that you can set up that it doesn't do very well on um, because, it's, it, it, because it doesn't have any, I would, I would argue it has zero conceptual understanding, none whatsoever. It doesn't know what a rook is. It doesn't know what a weak square is. It doesn't know the conditions under which you, you know, the general conditions under which you should launch a king side attack. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't know any of that stuff. It has no, no, none of that at all. It accomplishes the same uh, ends better, and for, uh, as against me, uh, better, but it accomplishes the same ends that I use intelligence for by non-intellectual means. And I'm going to say that I think that's true of all programs. Now, let me just want, I add something to that. Why is that true? Because that's easy to say, but why is that true? The difference is I am an entity, a living entity. I'm alive. I have goals. I have uh, values. I have consciousness. And particularly, I have volition. And I argue, I mean, the, the argument has been made by others. There's no cognition without volition. You can't actually be objective. Uh, the, the process of being objective, of objectively acquire, uh, acquiring knowledge requires volition, deterministic entities cannot do so. I'm gonna, I'll just give you the, a really brief version. You may know this argument. It's been around in philosophy since Epicurus. And, uh, but I'll give you the brief, uh, uh, perhaps best briefly described by example. Um, the mar uh, uh, in, in the crude, crudest forms of the arguments, of deterministic arguments, in crude Marxism, 
your beliefs are just a function of your economic, uh, you know, the economic conditions of your social class. That's what they argue. Well, all right, they, they don't see that that argument applies to their own beliefs. Their own beliefs are nothing but the results of the economic conditions. In other words, they are forced to believe what they believe without reference to the actual state of evidence. In other words, they can't be objective. And that's the same with the Freudians that believe that you are, your beliefs are the results of instinctual drives plus toilet training or whatever. I'm not up on the latest uh, uh, psychoanalytic uh, stuff. But anyway, again, the same, it's the same problem. Uh, if that's true, that would apply to the psychoanalyst, to Freud's and the other psychoanalyst beliefs. They're just the results of instinctual drives, which are irrational, according to them, are necessarily irrational. Or behaviorism that says everything is a matter of, you know, depending on the version, they word it differently, but, you know, it's contingencies of reinforcement. How you were rewarded and, and punished, they don't use those words, they don't like to, but that's what it is. Anyway, how you were rewarded and punished, rather than the evidence. That's the problem, deterministic entities, unless you were determined by logic or by, you know, by the evidence and logical examination. And we know that's not true because human beings make mistakes. That is a fact. So we know we're not uh, uh, logically determined by logic. Uh, uh, otherwise, determinism cannot uh, arrive at objective, any kind of objective knowledge. So it's self-refuting. And that problem comes up with the computers, uh, the, I guess the easiest way I can put it. I think this is right. Any, of course, uh, machine learning uh, has a lot of self-correcting uh, built into it, but you can only self-correct, a machine can only self-correct in accordance with the program. We, and if there's something wrong with the program, uh, as far as the self-correcting aspect, it can't really correct that, or you can't count on that. We humans can go beyond that. We, we're not algorithmic. We can go beyond any program and we're able to self-correct. That is our uh, one way of putting our advantage. And I would say that the current and current AI, there is nothing even approaching that. There's not even the slightest hint. When, uh, uh, by the way, the woman, uh, when, when I, uh, she answered my question, she said, well, this is the first step. Uh, and I, I was thinking to myself, I didn't actually say this, but I was, uh, the uh, philosopher Hubert Dreyfus came to mind who wrote the book, What Computers Can't Do. And, and, and uh, one example he, or, uh, parallel he gave is it's sort of like saying that when you climb a tree that's your first step to getting to the moon which it isn't <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing in this stuff there's nothing in anything i know of in artificial intelligence that has anything to do with the volitional control of conscious thought there's nothing even approaching that if someday you guys are able to embody and you'll have to embody it i think you have to have a robot mm -hmm. an embodied version if you can embody free consciousness and free will into the uh, and values and 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 maybe life, I don't know. Bob Bob wants life in there, so uh, <laughs> I, I I focus my focus is mainly on volition, but the the broader objectivist critique brings in life, values, consciousness, and then volition also. Until you embody those things, uh, it, I think it can't be called intelligent. So I, I've talked long enough. I should give you a chance to jump back in. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a long standing debate in artificial intelligence as to whether or not uh, something would have to mimic or resemble the way a human intelligence works in order to count. So Alan Turing famously posed the Turing test, a uh, situation in which uh, a interlocutor couldn't tell whether or not he was interacting with a machine or a human being if he's interacting with one of each and can't tell which is which. Uh, a as a test for human level intelligence and almost immediately that came under a fair amount of scrutiny because it's not clear that what you actually want is something that is able to act like a human would act or Im imitate a human any more than you want an airplane that is able to imitate the way a bird flies uh, or a submarine that looks like uh, like a fish I mean does a submarine swim well not really but I mean not not for most concepts of swim but you can kind of see that the problem I'm gesturing at so uh, just just to plant that flag there and let you know that that that's a long-standing issue. It's it's been well known for a long time. I tend to come down on more of a functionalist uh, position. So I, I don't much care how it works if it's able to you know outsmart me and play the stock market and uh, make appointments or you know convince people to donate money. That's already smart enough to do a lot of the stuff that I do. And it's, it's worth thinking carefully about its capacities and, and the ways in which it might threaten me in the future. Uh, I'll, I'll just note that uh, I, I think this is very much an open and live issue. No, nobody really 
really has, to the best of my knowledge, a good definition of an intelligence. It's more one of those, we know it when we see it kind of things. And even the people who are very, very smart, who are smarter than you know I am, often are not, not able to introspect on what those processes entail. And so they're not able really to tell me how it is that they function at that level. I kind of just have to watch it uh, in slack jaw at all, and then maybe learn what I can through the process. So uh, I, I don't think we're going to resolve that in the course of this conversation, but you're absolutely right. It's not very well known what intelligence is. Um, but I would say, again, if something is able to rewrite itself multiple times and then blast off to Alpha Centauri to build a Dyson sphere, that surely counts, even if I don't understand what's happening inside of it. Uh, you're, you're right to say that in an artificial intelligence, uh, there's not much, again, to my knowledge, in the way of compelling architectures that, that would actually give you a general intelligence. And that was another thing I wanted to note, uh, that you have, to, you have to specify that you're talking about a general intelligence. So with a narrow intelligence, like a chess playing robot, yes, it does not have, uh, it does not have the range that a human being does. And it, re it really doesn't do anything, as far as I know, that corresponds to the way a human being would reason about chess. And so it's not able to abstract principles at a high level that it can then apply to other fields. And that's, it's therefore far more limited than I am. But with a general intelligence, presumably, because it's general, you, you wouldn't be facing exactly those same sorts of constraints. Nobody knows how to build a general intelligence, in, in part because nobody knows how <laughs> human intelligence works, right? So, so we, we have not even succeeded yet in reverse engineering the only example of a, a general intelligence that we have. So we're a long way from building a general intelligence. But I have interviewed a couple of people who are at least trying to put architectures together that would work in this way. So we interviewed uh, Icelandic researcher Kristen Thornson way back in episode 10 or 20, something like that. He's put together an architecture, which I, I won't be able to remember all the details off the top of my head. He's got a number of papers about it uh, that is supposed to be a, a plausible uh, general intelligence. So it, it starts with a seed that does have goals and that you might have to put the goals in yourself, but it can develop sub goals over time. It, it would reason in an open ended way. It would have, uh, it would choose goals or it, you would give it goals and then it would choose further goals as a consequence of those. And I would also note, uh, and I, I'm just kind of shotgunning you because you shotgun you shotgun me, so I'm gonna I'm gonna shotgun you. Um, <laughs> Stephen Amahundro is a, a renowned artificial intelligence uh, pioneer, and he's got this idea of drives. Uh, drives are goals that manifest in the process of recursively self-improving because they're necessary for accomplishing a wide variety of other goals. So, for example, not being turned off or not being killed will probably be important to. Uh, robots or AIs or algorithms in the future because whatever terminal goals they do have cannot be serviced if they have been turned off. And there are others that he proposes as well, such as uh, gathering you know, more resources or recursively self-improving, becoming more intelligent because the smarter you are, the better you can accomplish most goals for a pretty wide variety of the space of possible goals. Um, all of that, you know, to Steve's point is, you know, fairly speculative. We're, we're talking papers, we're talking, you know, maybe there's some Python code written, there's maybe some theorems involved, and we're a long way from having, I think, a general reasoner. But I, I would just note that it doesn't necessarily have to fun function in a way that you would recognize to count as intelligence, at least as far as I'm concerned. And there are reasons to believe that if it is improving itself, it, it could become dangerous relatively quickly. Um, so it, it's worth thinking up front about how that might play out. Hello, this is Trent Fowler, co-host of the Futurati podcast. One of the most common pieces of marketing advice I've come across is to know your audience and give them what they want. One difficulty in podcasting is that it's actually pretty hard to do this. None of the major platforms give us any way to reach out to you, our listeners, to find out what you enjoy about the Futurati podcast and what you'd like to see done differently. So we've decided to record this commercial and ask you directly to reach out to us. Head over to futuratipodcast.com, go to the contact page, and drop us a line. Tell us about your favorite and least favorite episodes, what you'd like to see us cover in the future, and anything else you want us to know. We produce this show for you, and we want your advice so we can make it even better. Thank you. Um, I think you're right. It's going to be a something, but functional, functionalism or any kind of me me mechanism when you, uh, a program cannot go beyond the program, as Lee has said before, that uh, what you imbue in the, it, it, there's no cognition without volition. Perhaps a super, a, a AI could figure out that that's iambic pentameter, uh, uh, Lee's, uh, ingenious statement there, uh, but you can't get, you can't get something 
that's not there. There's no volition in this pro program, but, but there will be some, something. There is something there. Um, we have a couple of, and, and, and sorry for, for sh shotgunning uh, you. It's just, there's a lot to say and yeah, that's yeah. why we have Clubhouse. But I have a couple of, I, I have a super chat and a question. Okay. James, Let's take uh, it. Elliot. Okay, James, uh, who's been on the show before, he, he says, have you noticed connections between machine learning and Rand's theory of concepts? If so, could you give a few examples of such connections? And then one more, there's a super chat from Dylan Fritz. Fritz. Dylan Fritz, thank you for $10. Okay. Did he have a question? No, there's no question. Oh, okay. Right. He, just, he just gave so us money. Got, okay. So go yeah, ahead. So that, that's, um, you, that's for you. I, I, I can't think of a time that a person has sat down and said, I've read ITOE and also I'm a machine learning engineer and here's how we think concepts are forming. It's, it's something that's been on my mind. So as I've learned more about the objectivist theory of concepts, I've taken that with me in studying neural networks and thinking about how they reason in intermediary steps. And I, I can think of a couple papers that don't take an objectivist stance, but they do think a little bit about how there might be concepts or concept like things inside of these really deep neural networks, because sometimes you can output the intermediary steps. So it's like maybe an image classification or image generation system that's, that's very, very big and trained on a huge amount of data. So it's an extraordinarily complex system. And sometimes you can go through and output what it's thinking about at each layer. It's like, okay, at, at this layer, what is it doing with these images? And sometimes you can see things that aren't exactly concepts, but they're sort of like abstractions. It almost seems like it's, it's, uh, it's got a vague picture of a face. It's got like sort of an abstract version of a face, or it's got an abstract way of thinking about lines, or it's got an abstract way of thinking about vertices. Uh, and I'm using thinking that it's, it's not really thinking, but, using it, but at each step of processing, it seems to be using something kind of like an abstraction. Now that's, I mean, you know, the concept of an edge is about as low level as it gets. It's directly perceptual, but it does look like in these deeper systems, they're doing something kind of like forming the, the most basic sorts of concepts. And, I, you know, again, I, I don't know anybody who's an objectivist who's also thinking about this, but it is something that's been on my mind. And there are people who are, who are beginning to take that step of thinking about how concepts might be forming in these big systems. I actually know a couple of guys. Now, I don't know them very well, but I know a couple of guys who are in the field. Broadly, I don't know if they define themselves as machine learning uh, people exactly, but in the, at least in computer science that are trying to make th th this kind of connection. But I think they're up against exactly what I was talking about before. And I, I was more or less, I admit, I use the term intelligence, I think, as you, you know, you define it in terms of intelligence. But I tried to move away from that a little bit because intelligence is a poorly defined concept mm -hmm. and psychology is often defined as intelligence is what intelligence tests measure which is entirely <laughs> circular and right, right, uh, not very and useless pretty useless so uh, there are better attempts than that there are better attempts but it's not 100 percent clear i i framed it more, mainly in terms of conceptual understanding and objectivity and those are two things i'm what i'm claiming i'm claiming that they are not just impossible by virtue of we haven't come across the right programs or that someday somebody might figure they're impossible in principle. I think that my argument is they are impossible in principle to any algorithmic solution. Any deterministic solution is impossible. So until you get past determinism in your, and what they're, what you're doing, and I, I don't see any, you know, uh, uh, even a, going that direction, by the way, putting in either pseudo random, or even if you put in a radioactive, you know, uh, mm -hmm. piece of radioactive material and, and, and real randomness in there somehow. Uh, that's indeterminism is not volition. And there's a con the contradiction of indeterminism is just as bad. In fact, it's more obvious than the contradiction of determinism. So that doesn't help. You have to get actual volition. And there's absolutely, I see absolutely no reason to think that anybody is doing anything that is even close to that, that they're even, they don't even know to think about it, for one thing, I don't think anybody in the field, perhaps excepting you, Trent, maybe, <laughs> I don't think anybody knows what has really knows what free will is. Uh, most most uh, most computer scientists probably don't believe in it. Are probably no, against free will. So it's just not even coming, not even coming close. And nothing they're doing is coming from close. And I I think that's that's just an impressible barrier that you'll have to overcome only by means that nobody has the slightest idea 
and that we're not even uh, even close to. I would throw one other thing in here since I, I'm allowed to apparently shotgun a little bit. Uh, causality. <laughs> Human beings understand, but what part of a major part of conceptual understanding is grasp of causality as opposed to just uh, statistical association. Now, how do we do that? Uh, this is, uh, we don't know exactly, but I, I think one thing that's very important in our grasp of causality is the fact that we are volitional beings so that when a baby pushes a ball, well, it, it doesn't, have to be, let's say a child pushes a young child, very young child pushes a ball, you know you caused it because you did it. You know it's your causality involved because you did it. So volition is, I think, very important in our grasp of causality. And I have no reason to think that computers have anything close to that. I read Judea Pearl's popular book, and I don't know what to make of it, but I don't think yeah, it ended yeah. up with, well, well now, we, now we know how to do causality. I don't think it ended up with that. And again, I don't, personally, I don't think uh, that's going to be solved in the computer field until and unless someday in the future you create living, goal-directed, consciousness, conscious, and especially volitional um, entities. And good luck. I, I'd like, I, I'd be interested to see that, uh, but I don't think that's happening anytime soon. So that's my, I guess, my main argument against a singularity coming up anytime soon. You know, what's that guy? How do you pronounce his name? Vinge? V-I-N-G? Vinge. Werner Vinge, yeah. We, we are, we are pretty much at the edge uh, of, the, of his prediction. He gave like 20 to 40 years, and that was about 40 years ago. I think next year, you know, we're coming up. To, and I, I'll bet you right now that his prediction is just will be falsified next year. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not looking for it anytime really soon. Now, I don't know. I'm interested with Trent. Do you think it's going to happen soon? But you, you don't have to answer that uh, until you want to discuss, you know, uh, take issue with what I just said about, yeah, no, uh, I, about free will. I, I think, but I think, I think free will is an in-principle and consciousness is an in-principle barrier. It's not just, well, we haven't yet got the right program. We just need to pay, it's, this will, it will develop uh, with uh, better programs, bigger programs, more data, I don't know what. None of that stuff will solve the problem. It's an in-principle problem and you have to have a, uh, what I think would be, have to be an entirely different approach to the issues. That's what I think, so go ahead, Trent. Yes, so I'll throw that I, I think it's worth getting into I think it's worth getting into the difference between current machine learning techniques and artificial intelligence more broadly. So people can yeah. conflate these two things and they're not the same thing. So what I do generally is just take a, a bunch of data, feed it into an algorithm. It learns some kind of function and it's able to output new things when you feed it new data. So I could build some kind of model that does a pretty good job of guessing house prices because I've got lots and lots of data on you know, how many rooms houses have and how close they are to the ocean, how many neighbors they have and how close, you know, and I can either choose the features, engineer features, pass it all in and it, it could do pretty well, pick stocks or what have you, but it's really just math all the way down. I'm fond of saying that machine learning isn't magic, but it's just, it's just math all the way down. There's just some function that it's learning and then it's able to, you know, take in new inputs and spit out new outputs. And sometimes those are useful and sometimes they're not. And if I can get them to be useful, I get paid money. Uh, artificial intelligence is a, is, a more, is a broader thing. I, arguably machine learning might fall under, under that umbrella, but the artificial intelligence I think is, is a much broader field and it, it addresses itself more to the question of what intelligence is, how you might be able to instantiate it in Silicon, not necessarily a deterministic program such as the Python we write today, but you know, something that's not wetware. It's not like a human being. I think you're right. Uh, I'm very skeptical that deep learning or these approaches will get us to a general intelligence. I mentioned earlier, it's gotten us a lot further than we thought it would. We've all been kind of surprised at what has been possible with them, but I, I don't think that they're going to wake up anytime soon and become goal-directed. I will note that, you know, th there's ongoing work to make goal-directed systems. Reinforcement learning systems are very, very crude and very primitive. It's, it's not the kind of thing you're describing, but they do have a goal. There's a thing they're trying to accomplish and you sort of guide them through the process of interacting with their environment. And some of those systems are able to start from basically nothing at all and learn how to play 10 video games, 15 video games. They come up with really unique solutions. They're not volitional in the way that you're describing. They do have goals and they are able to do things that are pretty surprising that we've been pretty surprised about. I tend to share your conclusion that 
an alternative approach will be required. It's probably not going to come from neural networks. It's probably not going to come from reinforcement learning. It, it will come from somebody sitting down from first principles and thinking through what intelligence is, coming up with a sensible proxy for that and coding it up. I do think also it will require goal directedness. I think that's necessary for uh, deriving principles from the environment. I, I more or less agree with all, all of what you said, but I, I don't, I don't in principle think that it's impossible to do those things in computers. Uh, that having been said, I, I don't think, you know, we're 20 years away from a singularity. Uh, we're probably much further away from it than that, but, uh, you know, there can be discontinuities <laughs> in the development of these fields. So uh, the hope, and by the way, I, I never even mentioned I never even mentioned why it's worth talking about. So there are people who are trying to think seriously about the ways in which you would get a recursively self-improving agent to have an ethical architecture that's consistent with what you know human beings would want. So that if you're dealing with something much, much smarter than you are, it doesn't look at you as mass that it can repurpose for something else. It does value you in some way, or it's at least willing not to kill you and, and hear your arguments. Um, that's something we can get into if you want to, but the, the whole impetus behind the discussion is to think about the ways in which you might have a machine ethics that would make a super intelligence not as dangerous uh, as it otherwise might be because it's not clear that if you just set it loose and let it converge on whatever goals it has that what comes out of that process will be something that we we can live with or survive with are you enjoying this episode of the futurati podcast if so please like it Give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and share it with your friends. By far, the best way to help us grow is to spread the word on social media, which will expose our content to more people and help us continue to bring you interviews with world-leading experts in AI, quantum computing, cryptocurrencies, and so much more. Thank you in advance. Okay, that's interesting. I, 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 um, a couple of things. One, I, I wanted to just reemphasize that I'm talking about something which I think is an in-principle issue, not just with machine learning, but with uh, computer science, if you will, generally, insofar as computer programs are algorithms, insofar as that's true, they cannot, it is, my argument is that they can't be objective uh, and they cannot embody conceptual understanding. That is impossible to an algorithmic, uh, that is to say deterministic or indeterministic, because that doesn't matter. Uh, system and uh, that's I'm arguing that volition is necessary and I, I'm you know again we're, we're, if they if somebody can figure out how to give a mechanical system consciousness and volition and I'm going to throw in life and values to satisfy Bob <laughs> and you know that's true <laughs> but I, I I focus on I have my reasons for focusing on consciousness and volition but those are all true you're gonna have to have all of those things and good luck I mean I I, I wouldn't mind seeing it but I don't think it's coming anytime soon and then I wanted to just uh, go back to one thing I forgot to mention again. Uh, I forgot about uh, that was a key concept. I'm always looking for key concepts to activate knowledge about. That's what I teach. I teach key, key concept thinking. And whenever I listen to anybody, I'm looking for key concepts. And one of them, I, and what you said that I didn't follow up on that I'd like to is the word magical. You said human, I don't know, was it human thinking, human cognition, human, human behavior is not magical. Um, I don't think it's magical, but I do think that it is a function of consciousness and volition. And that's what, you know, a pure materialist, the pure materialists call that magic. I wouldn't call it magic because I, for the simple reason, I am in direct contact with that. I'm aware of it by direct uh, awareness that I am, uh, that I am conscious, that I have volition, that the fact that I have volition, I can choose to direct my attention which is what basically what volition boils down to, the direction of attention. But I can do that. I know that from direct experience. It's not something that I just made up uh, magically. So I, I, I guess I would object to the term magic there. I would say, no, it's not magical. It's, but it's not, it's not a, uh, I'm looking, you know, we, we don't have the right terms for all this stuff. It's not a material phenomenon. It's not exactly a, a physical phenomenon. It's not exactly a phenomenon of physics. It's something more than that, but I know that from direct experience is what I'm saying. So um, I'm just wondering what you what you had in mind by magical. Yeah, so I usually I, I throw that in partly because it's provocative. But what I <laughs> what I ultimately I, I think ten years ago I, I probably would have claimed that intelligence is algorithmic. I I, I wouldn't stand by that today. Uh, what I, what I mostly meant is just you know we don't have currently any good reason, and maybe you disagree with this if, if you think it's non physical to to believe that the silicon agent couldn't function, you know, at the level of a human being or beyond like there's, I, 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 
it's sort of a a repudiation of what's called carbon chauvinism sometimes there's just something <laughs> about the human brain that that makes it special and no machine will ever will ever come to it i don't think there's a good reason philosophically to believe that and i think that we've surely been humbled by now over 25 or 30 years of seeing all these things that only humans would ever be able to do now being done by machines at, at just as high a level so uh, it, do, it doesn't follow that you'll get a general reasoner out of that but i don't see any reason to think that you know the gen the faculty that allows us to engage in open-ended cognition necessarily depends on on the fact that we happen to have uh, carbon-based neurons I, I don't see any reason to think a priori that you just never in a thousand years could you make an agent in a computer with a computer that's able to do those things as well and that's all i mean okay. by magical issue all right i i don't have i don't have a strong opinion no you know john searle argues that point that there's something about not necessarily carbon but something about biology mm -hmm. that is essential and uh i i i I, I somewhat resonate to that argument, but I don't think it's convincing. But actually, I think it's, it's a little bit beside the point because talking about it in terms of carbon versus silicon is conceding the materialist premise that consciousness yep. doesn't matter. And I think consciousness is, is not epiphenomenal. I think that's nonsense. And well, then consciousness, so consciousness emerges from the brain, but is not reducible to the brain. It, and as we need it, uh, the brain is uh, clearly necessary as far as I know, um, mm -hmm. there's a plenty of evidence that's necessary. If you squash the brain, you know, the consciousness goes away. Actually, if you right. take a pin and stick it right. in just the right place, it might be two places, but it, it, consciousness is extinguished. Boom, mm -hmm. goes away. So the, the dependence of consciousness on the brain is pretty well established. But that doesn't mean that they are the same thing. The materialism is true. It's, a, it's an emergent property. And when I choose to do something, that has causal consequences. I, that's what I would say against against a pure physicalist. Yeah, I have not revisited the, those debates in some time. So a lot of this is stale thinking that I might want to revise. But I, I agree with everything you said. I'm not sure it follows that consciousness is necessarily non-physical. And it may. I, I, I don't have a particularly strong opinion. I'm not a philosopher of mind. So uh, yeah. I, I believe, I, I agree with you that consciousness Consciousness is an emergent phenomenon. I mean, it's, I agree with all, all of your lines of evidence. It's very clear that, you know, if, if you can go in and change one part of the brain and, and you can't see the color blue anymore, then, you know, obvi obviously there's there's some sort of physical correlate there. Uh, but I, I don't know that I would say that consciousness is therefore beyond physics or that it's non-physical. Uh -huh. uh, it seems like you, I, I'm sure if I worked hard enough at it, I could come up with an example of an emergent physical phenomenon. And if that's the case, then consciousness oh, yeah. might be. Oh, yeah. There, order. there are now, plenty of emergent. I now, think it, it would be of emergent. It would be a I'm special sorry, kind of emergent I'm phenomenon. Sorry, it would yeah. be a special kind of emergent phenomenon in as much as yes. it's illuminated from the inside. And of course, this is one of the deepest questions in philosophy, and I, I don't have a good answer yeah. to it. So maybe that that doesn't that doesn't tail that it's non-physical, but I'm not prepared to bite that bullet just yet. Okay, I'm gonna bite it. I'm gonna bite that bullet unless <laughs> <laughs> now, I, now, I do think consciousness consciousness is important. It's obvious, it's causally efficacious. I, d I don't believe in uh, epiphenomenalism. That's always struck me, even as an undergrad, that struck me as silly. It's like, well, but I can sit Good. here and, Good. you know, like think think back to a, a conversation I've had and get angry, right? So that's like, you know, it, it's consciousness directly influencing the underlying physical systems. It, it seems pretty fairly. I don't. I actually don't think that thing. example works myself. But that's a whole other subject. But let me let me uh, just deal with the uh, physicalism, which is a tricky issue because you know when you're talking about physicalism, whether it's something physical, you have to know what what are you talking about when you're talking about physics? Are you talking about something that exists now? Are you talking about everything that we might discover in the future that we might call physics? It's a little hard. But if we if we refer to physics as here's here's my simple argument, I think it's uh, I, I I use free will for all kinds of stuff. It, it's a very powerful idea. Uh, to use uh, uh, in a lot of arguments if you hold to it, if you believe it, if you accept the validity of free will. Anyway, in this, in this case, um, if we take physics to being the principles that we learn, uh, the principles uh, governing the behavior of matter and energy that we learn by studying inanimate matter and energy, and that we, and, and I'm going to limit it to what, more or less to what we already know, uh, at least loosely, and say, uh, under those conditions, uh, with that being the, what we're talking about, uh, I think we've done pretty well at, at uh, reducing phenomena of, of uh, life other than consciousness 
to physical processes. I think you know molecular biology has pretty much reduced that. Uh, I mean, that's arguable, but I think that's true. But consciousness, however, is another uh, another matter, and then it's another matter. There, there are two kinds of arguments. Some, some of them had to do with conscious experience, which I'm not going to go into. You probably know the uh, Mary, the neurophysiological neuro, neurophysiologist. That's a pretty good thought experiment. But I, let me leave that one aside and go for my, uh, you know, the stuff that I really like, which is volition. Uh, the laws of physics basically uh, are, are mathematically expressed as differential equations. And the differential equation has an input and a definite output. Let's not worry about Schrodinger and, and quantum stuff, which I think just sure, makes sure. it worse. It okay. doesn't work help anyway, and also makes things worse as far as determinism, uh, indeterminism. But uh, not more worrying about that. You have these uh, differential equations. So physics is de basically deterministic. Again, ex I mean, accepting uh, quantum, and I, I, I don't think that, I really don't think that matters. Volition is not deterministic. That's the free will necess necessarily is um, a first cause, a cause not uh, reducible to antecedent causes. That being the case, there's no possibility of it, of it being explained by physics, unless you expand physics to me what I, what I used to think when I was a freshman physics major, I quickly changed, you know, I ch changed over to psychology, but, but I, I thought like all freshman physics majors pretty much that physics is a study of everything. But it's not. It's the study of physics, physical stuff. If you expand it to the being the study of everything, then it is tautologically true. But otherwise, if you have any any sensible meaning of the term, uh, consciousness and volition do not come under the purview of, of physics because of because of determinism, basically. So that's uh, basically how I would dispose of that. Uh, do you need a dynamic and knowledgeable speaker for an event? Thomas Fry and me, Trent Fowler, are both seasoned keynote speakers able to converse on a wide array of topics to audiences of all sizes and skill levels. Go to the contact page at futuratipodcast.com to book Thomas or myself today and let us apply our years of experience in public speaking to make your event a smashing success. Maybe Bob wants to add, I don't know, he looks like he wants to add something. I've got two points I want to make, but it'll take a while for both of them. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> and then we'll turn it back to Trent. The, the first one is that although we don't have a way of manufacturing silicon-based intelligence proving recursive things, carbon-based intelligence recursive improvement has been going on quite well. In fact, if you take machines as being agents of what humans have built to, do, to accomplish things, and it's increased exponentially. We have recursively been able to solve chess problems that couldn't have been solved before. Uh, we've been able to predict other things that couldn't be done before. And we're doing them using things that the human carbon-based consciousness has created. And we all know that it's possible to create other, other human other carbon-based intelligence. <laughs> Made a few of them. Uh, so that, that was the first point. Uh, the second point is, I think we ought to go into, where do you come up with your understanding of the, of the phrase or the common co concept intelligence? If you think about what Ayn Rand had to do in order to prove her objectivist ethics, she noted, you can't even have the concept of value if you don't know what life is. Mm -hmm. Now, I challenge you to understand what the concept of intelligence actually means without reducing it through awareness of reality, perception, volition, consciousness, life. Uh, I don't think you can get to the term intelligence without those. You're using it as a floating abstraction. And that's why I think Lee's point, his principal point, is absolutely true. And I'm just more, more fundamental than he is. And I, I go down to life. I, I don't stop at volition. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Well, so when I was thinking all this through, I didn't really have the toolkit of objectivism and the concept of reduction, you know, going going all the way, all the way back to sensory data. So, I mean, you could be right. Maybe if I perform the reduction, uh, I would come away from the idea, I'd come away with the idea that, you know, in some important sense, intelligence requires life. Uh, but if, if life is a, you know, process of self-generated and self-sustained action, I, I still don't know that it necessarily must be carbon-based or must mm -hmm. function in the way that a human being does. And so maybe maybe it would necessitate a broadening of the concept of life uh, to, to complete that reduction. And that's all off the cuff. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily stand by that at a PhD defense, but uh, that's sort of my my initial response to that. Uh, I do think that'd be a very worthwhile exercise, though, is trying to, to take it and do the standard objectivist uh, uh, process of say, okay, when we see intelligence in birds, what is it that they do? And when we see intelligence in men, what is it that they do? And when we see intelligence in a in an algorithm, what is it that they do? Maybe, uh, maybe it is a floating abstraction and does not properly subsume all of those different instances. Uh, that, that would be a, a year long project probably of trying to think through all of that. But I think it's a worthwhile exercise and, and um, I'm not sure how that would come out. I'd have to think about it. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that it's impossible for it to be a silicon based life. Maybe it is, but it's gotta be living or it's not gonna be intelligent. They, they have them in science fiction. There are yeah. silicon-based lives in science. I can't remember the which uh, I, I, I can think of Hal Clement, one, but I, I don't remember the uh, titles. But yeah, it's, it occurs in science fiction. That means it's true. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it's got to be a TV no, that's, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, and, and if that's the case, then I, I think it would point the way towards the synthesis of some of my comments and, and Lee's as well. It's, you'd have to have a general agent that has some sort of set of open-ended goals, which can be amended. It's got to have some way of interacting with the world, actuators. It's got to have a sensory apparatus, which I think would not get you to human consciousness exactly, but it would give you a faculty for perceiving that which exists, uh, which is a, the objectivist definition of the, con the axiom of consciousness. Um, which has always seemed to me to be a little different than um, awareness, awakeness, you know, so liminality. That's maybe a rabbit hole we shouldn't get down in the in the closing five <laughs> minutes. But uh, well, no, I, I, I think all of that would be a very worthwhile. Soon, so that's a good I think that would be very worthwhile. <laughs> rabbit holes are good in Clubhouse. Yeah, yeah. Steve, you got anything else you want to jump in here, Steve? No, I have rabbit holes as well. we'll <laughs> yeah. So should we should we meet over? Well, I guess we've pretty much come to a fairly good agreement about most things. I don't know. I don't think there's uh, a lot. Give us a summary wrap up, will you, Steve? Well, I th I think uh, the whole idea of a singularity is. Maybe it's too strong to say, but it's it's a bombastic idea. I think it's a it's an important you know it's it comes out of the uh, scientific revolution. We're all excited. It's one of the revolutions that made the made the industrial revolution possible, and then the political revolution. But life is the basis, and and what you get in these methodologies today. Uh, when they induce, it's about probabilities. They don't even, most of science uh, uh, goes at what they call science uh, with this, a statistical foundation. And so it's not even, it, it's just out of the ballpark for me to, to call a singularity. Limitedly, I know there's something here and I'm very excited about about technology and what it does, but I'm very skeptical of calling anything like this transhumanism as well. It's it's a uh, yeah, it's pregnant with with rationalism. Well, let's shall we go on to Clubhouse, gentlemen? Okay. Is it yeah, time? I'll, be over to, I'll be over in a couple minutes. I got to check on my son, but uh, yeah. Should okay. I just, uh, I just you, hop on. I, I followed you now, so I just hop on. Great. The room you start. Great. Great. We'll be there. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks for coming on, Trent. You were great. Thanks so much Come for on. inviting me, guys. This was a lot of fun. Okay.